We are in chapter two. As I just said, we've gone over the three methods that represent the most common form of the iterative methods, basically dim and decimation and and this mode space uh, approach that we've just gone through, which you can view as um, exact if these eigenmodes are exact. Um, but even when we do our just in practice, nothing's ever exact, right? So in practice, often um, when we're going back to just this generalized, gen, right? This is the starting point, create, doing this generalized eigenvalue problem. And I think quite often people will put in uh, some imaginary term, you know, I eta there, in which case, you know, it's really no different from the iterative approaches. And, and you'd want to have a very small i eta, otherwise everything's going to be either exponentially uh, decaying or growing. It's been a while since we've used this approach. We really don't use it anymore. But, you know, Matthew Louisier published a long paper on different methods to uh, do this calculation and um, sort of discuss the numerical efficiency of these different approaches. Another thing I was saying during the break is that, again, the mo most robust approach of the iterative approaches, when we were, uh, uh, when Christian Rivas and I were looking at this a lot, doing the uh, modeling silicon in various places in the band, um, you know, this, re this relies on this eigen, generalized eigen solver. In some places it just wouldn't wouldn't work. It would come back as like, you know, it wouldn't find all the eigenmodes. There'd be some problem. And you can imagine that, you know, if you're someplace in the band where you have some singularity or something or high degeneracy or something, it just may be numerically unstable for this type of calculation. Whereas when, when we do the iterative approach, it, you know, with an eta in there, it's always going to converge. You're always going to get something. When you think of how that dim algorithm works, I mean, it's just incredibly robust. So, as, you know, in the code that Christian Rivas was writing, when we were using this, he actually, you know, had like some kind of if-then-else statement, like first would, would try this approach, and then if it came back with an error, then would do the dumb iterative approach. And so we'd always get a solution. But at the time, you know, this approach was faster, although it clearly requires more coding. Right. A lot more coding than the dumb iterative approach. Okay, um, so pictorially I have this little picture in the notes of what's going on. So if we um, look in the left lead, sort of what we've just done is we inject in some orbital beta, we then see how it goes to all other orbitals, gamma. And I'm going to inject in one orbital. And so this is all at site zero. And then from all the other orbitals, it's going to go into the four modes, chi 1 through chi 4, so chi um, 1. All these will be my left moving modes. It goes into the four modes. These four modes propagate backwards to the left. Once you're in a mode, you stay in a mode, right? They're eigen modes. And each one picks up a phase factor Z4 inverse, Z3 inverse. Z2 inverse and Z1 inverse. 
each one picks up their own phase factor. And then back here at site negative one, I pro project them all back to some orbital alpha. And that's sort of pictorially what the sort of projection we just did to relate g negative 1, 0 to g 0, 0. And in the, in the last part of uh, chapter 2, I talk about, so, um, you know, in the model, in the example we just did, we just had some site with four orbitals and coupled to the next site. SP3, SP3, nearest neighbor coupling. But in general, for the semiconductors you deal with, the structure, say, going in a 100 direction is anion, cation, anion, cation. Right? This would be the structure in the common layers. And in the nearest neighbor coupling model, the coupling looks like this. But the unit cell, the thing that gets repeated, looks like this. Right? These are the unit cells in red. But the coupling only couples, you know, it doesn't, there is no coupling um, from like C to C. That doesn't exist, right? The, the only coupling is from C to A. So the coupling is more sparse than the unit cell size. The coupling is only actually half the unit cell size in these nearest neighbor type binding models when you have two atoms per unit cell. Right? The size of the coupling matrix, so your unit cell size here in our SP3 is 8 by 8. Right? That's the block that represents your unit cell. But the coupling the T is 4 by 4. The T matrices, the couple, one side to the next, are only 4 by 4. And so your matrix, your Hamiltonian matrix is, you know, block tridiagonal, but the blocks are, the block sizes are 4 by 4 in the matrix. Right? Because this, you know, each atom, the matrix for each atom is 4 by 4. The coupling matrices are four by four, but the unit cell size is eight by, the repeat unit is eight by eight. The thing that actually gets repeated is your unit cell in the crystal. And so because of that, you can, if you go back and look at, you know, this generalized eigenvalue solution way back when. Now, first of all, to do this, you have to double the size of your matrices. So you know, if D is 8 by 8, that's our repeat unit, then you're solving a 16 by 16 generalized eigenvalue solution. Um, so if you can just work with the 4 by 4 matrices, you know, since inversion is uh, n cubed uh, computation, if you can work with the 4 by 4 matrices, you come out way ahead instead of working with 8 by 8. So the last part of the chapter is just, you know, going into the details of when you have a system like this, like silicon, gallium, arsenide, in a nearest neighbor model, um, how to write the equation so you deal with the 4x4 four four matrices instead of the 8x8 eight eight matrices to do this. It sort of you know, um, goes into a lot of detail, which I don't think we need. You know, we just need sort of a understand the higher level concepts, and if you ever run into you know, something you know where to look for it and you sort of understand what they're talking about. So that's the last, what the last part of chapter two is about. How to take a system like this and uh, just do it efficiently so you work with the four by four matrices instead of the actual eight by eight repeat units. Okay then, so now we are on to chapter three. I mean everything we've done so far we've really been thinking about some one dimensional chain but, you know, in reality, you, you've got to model something with a finite cross-section. 
you're never really just going to be doing a 1D atomic chain. And this chapter just talks about you know, what's involved with um, generalizing what we've done when you've got a finite cross-section. And so the first example is, say you have a nanowire. A nanowire or, similarly, from a computational point of view, a carbon nanotube. Okay, How would you go about applying everything we've done to modeling a nanowire? So now you have some, you know, for your nanowire, you have some finite cross-section, and say so you'd want to be calculating the current you know, the current flowing through some finite cross-section that would be made up of a bunch of atoms like this, right, going down, down your nanowire. So how do you apply everything we've done so far to modeling system like this? Or, of course, your carbon nanotube where you've just got a ring of atoms in layers, dot, 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 same sort of thing, except it's... You can just think of it as a hollow nanowire, right? It's hollow with just rings of atoms, rings of carbon atoms. How would you uh, apply everything we've done to model current flowing down the uh, carbon nanotube? And in general, we will, we still want to do this in you know a a localized orbital representation, some full band structure model where you have your sp3 or sp3d d5 basis for for each atom in the system okay so um, what we're always going to do is is lay define our numbering system so that you're de always dealing with a layered structure so if we're doing our nano wire just assume some very simple geometry. You have planes of atoms. And so, as I go down my nanowire, I'm, I'll move them apart considerably for visualization. I've got my next plane of atoms here, et cetera, et cetera. And then each plane becomes what we've been calling my diagonal block in my Hamiltonian. So this would be D1, you know, this would be D2, this would be D3. So all the atoms and all the orbitals become one big diagonal block in my Hamiltonian. And then my, my coupling blocks are the blocks to couple one plane to the next. T12, T23, etc. And so if you lay out your Hamiltonian like this, and it still has exactly the form you know, that we've been dealing with, it's just now all the blocks are really big. D1, D2, D3, etc. And you're coupling. T12, T21, T23, etc. The important point is it still has the same block tridiagonal structure. T3, row column, 3, 2, etc. 0. Zero, 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 so it has the same block <coughs> tridiagonal structure. And as long as it has this structure, then everything works exactly as it did before. You know, your 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 um All the algorithms, every equation we've written where we carefully kept track of the indices goes through exactly um, like what we did in chapter one, where you replace the epsilons with the d's, or in calculating the surface green function, we were already using this notation.
So, you know, it's just a matter of ordering your Hamiltonian like this, so all the, in, in this layered form. And if your Hamiltonian looks like this, then we can use all the algorithms we've done so far, more, we, the uh, iterative, that um, our dim algorithm, you know, looks like exactly what it did before, you know, G, zero zero would be our e minus d zero that'd be your block minus uh, what is it t zero minus one g zero zero t minus one zero inverse and these are all now your whatever the size of these each block is whatever the size of your d or t block is here Right, so these just become your block, whatever the size of one of these big blocks is. And the same thing holds for our carbon nanotube. Uh, I'm not even going to try to draw this. Let me see if I have my notes up. Oh, I guess I had to reboot. Okay, so this is what we just drew. Right, that would be like what you dealing with with a nanowire and the carbon nanotube is even nicer it also this is, I guess this is a um, zigzag carbon nanotube um, but again it comes in layers of atoms and you can see they've been numbered here um, the coupling matrices between like this layer and this layer are going to be different than between this layer and this layer simply because, you know, if you number these um, as you go around the circle of your carbon nanotube, this couples the same number, this hopping element here, this bond, whereas this couples to like one number ahead and one number behind as you go from layer to layer. But the important point is that, you, you know, the size of the blocks, so for your carbon nanotube, for your CNT, even though the structure of the matrix is different, the size of the block is uh, the same. So going from, um, I guess the way he, these were numbered, he was considering one layer, one layer as, as like two atomic layers. Um, but in the nearest neighbor coupling atom, each atomic layer, each atomic layer will be a block. And if you think of your pi bond model where you put one orbital on each atom, all right, just like what we did with graphene, because this is really just a roll sheet of graphene, right? And you model it with the same pi bond model. You'd have one orbital per atom, and then each layer, each each one of these where the line is, each one of these layers of atoms would become a block. So for a 12-0 carbon nanotube with 12 atoms, your block would be 12 by 12 by 12. And you'd have a bunch of 12 by 12 blocks coupled by 12 by 12 block coupling matrix elements. Again, it would look like the exact same form. And with these, the atoms in a block don't couple to each other. The square. Well, then, if you look at again, if you look at, it's only nearest neighbor coupling. So this atom is only coupling to atoms in the layer behind it and atoms in the layer ahead of it. So only in different layers. Yeah, right. But with that, the first nanowire you drew, they would still couple to each other, wouldn't they? Still so right. So it's just so that's just going to affect. So for the carbon nanotube, the D block. It's just going to be a diagonal block, right? It's not here. Your D block is just going to be a diagonal block. For the carbon nanotube. Because there's no cup. Because for nearest neighbor coupling, all the nearest neighbors are in another layer. But for your, for your 
nanowire, your D block is just going to be a full, it's going to be completely filled in everywhere. Well, not everywhere. It's actually going to be, sorry, my bad. It's two dimensional. So it'll be essentially a banded matrix. I guess for a two dimensional type binding model, it would be um, what five bands. It's going to be banded. And when you do a two dimensional type binding model, you're going to have your diagonal, you'll have your tri diagonal, and then you'll have some one more off diagonal. So it'll be a banded matrix like this for your nanowire. Because if you think of, you know, each atom is going to have four nearest neighbors within the same layer. So it'll be sparse, but it won't be diagonal. Sparse, banded, sparse, and banded. It really doesn't matter matter at the end because you always end up you, know, you, you always end up um, you know I mean like here's where it shows up <clears throat> here's where the D matrix shows up in in this algorithm for your surface screen function right you have to add onto your D zero a bunch of other stuff that's not like this is never going to be diagonal or this is always going to be a full matrix. This thing here will always be a completely full matrix, right? And so, at the end of to calculate this, I always end up inverting a full matrix of whatever size I'm dealing with. Because when I add that to D, no matter what D looks like, I end up with a full matrix the size of D. So to calculate the surface green function, and this is why I said this is where a lot of computation time ends up. Um, you have to invert this matrix, the size of the number of states in your cross-sectional region. You have to invert that a lot. At each energy, you've got to have it converge. So that may be 20 iterations at most with your uh, decimation method. Um, you can do that for each energy, and in a moment we'll show for infinite cross sections, you have to do it for each k at each energy. So this is a you know if your if your cross section is finite, then really nothing changes. You're just dealing with bigger block matrices than what we've been dealing with before. You just have to set up your Hamiltonian so that you know the way everything is ordered is that the all the indices of the first layer come first then all the indices of the second layer, third layer, etc. So just a matter of numbering, numbering so that, I mean, you know, if you have, if you have this structure and you don't number it smartly, your Hamiltonian will just be a mess, right? You've got to number it so all these indices come first, then these indices, then these indices, and then it's going to be this block tridiagonal form. And this is, so this is what we were just talking about. So these are actually the, um, um, T's for this carbon nanotube. Okay. Here's your carbon nanotube. This is the T that couples you from layer one to layer two. So let's layer one one to two, I guess maybe from here to here. So let's see what that, let's see if that's correct. So, um, this is coupling, uh, you gotta look at how this is numbered. So, you know, each, each atomic layer, you have to choose, call this atom one, two, three, right? And then you got to decide which one you want to call one here. So call this one, two, three. So this guy here is going to couple to, well, let's choose this guy. He's going to couple to atom one and atom two. So two, two, atom two here will couple to atom one and atom two of the next layer. So if I look over here, um, this guy, which is two, right? Row two is coupling to atom one and atom two. Right? And well, I have a bunch of dot dot dots after that. Atom one 
If you go back here, atom one is coupling to atom one and atom N, the last atom, because this thing is wrapping around on itself. And this is what we see here. So this guy couples to atom one and atom N of the other layer. Right? And if you go to the if you go to, to uh, what's the, the next one? Uh, this, this guy here, these always couple to the same number. So this coupling should be diagonal, and that's what we see here. So the T's are all the same size. They just have different internal structure depending on which layer you're talking about. And so these will just alternate, just as the layers alternate. I'll alternate one type of T, the next type, and then back and forth, back and forth. Anyway, so this is an example of, of what the T's look like for that um, carbon nanotube. And as I said, the diagonal blocks are just diagonal. So you got, for each layer, you've got a diagonal block, and then these alter, the alternating st structure of your T's. All right, so that's pretty much all we need to say about finite cross-sections. Um, other than the fact that finite cross-sections are painful because, again, because of this right here. The thing you have to invert to calculate your surface green function, and later we'll see in the algorithms we develop for calculating your transmission, you have to invert many times something that's the size of the the block, something that's this block size. And it looks like here I go through some um, you know estimation of what we're talking about. So if you did a nanowire, let's say 10 by 10 nanometers, which doesn't seem too big. Uh, so in this plane, there are 540 atoms. Say we use an, one of the more simple basis sets, sp3s star. So there would be um, five orbitals on each atom. So that's 5,040 5, orbitals for each plane, right? So each block, this, each D block it would be this size, right? Containing 2.9 times 10 to the seventh elements, right? And in general, these numbers are complex. And if your resources permit, double complex. And so the storage of one of these blocks requires this much RAM, 466 megabytes of RAM. Um, it's, double complex. it's like two reels stuck together. One one for the one for the uh, real part, and one for the imaginary part. So it's like a, a double two double precision reels to store one double complex number. Um, I think MATLAB. I think does it by default just use double precision and double complex? That's what I was told. I don't know enough about MATLAB. Maybe uh, it's one number. And they say 16, uh, 53 bit for the Metisa. Oh, no. I mean, I think, yeah, I think, I mean, usually, you know, a complex number is just stored as like two real numbers, keeping track of the real and imagined. Yeah, right, exactly. So, um, let's see. 6.6 .6 atomic layers per, okay, and so for each nanometer of length of your wire, you've got 6.6 .6 layers for each nanometer of length. So if you're gonna do a 30 nanometer long nanowire, which is kind of short if you think of device modeling to get all your electric fields to die out, you know, if you apply a bias, by the time you get to the end of the source and end of the drain, uh, you've got 198 atomic layers. Each layer has this, you know, 2.9 times 10 to the seventh numbers in it. Um, 
And so for each layer, you've got one diagonal block and one upper off diagonal block. And the lower off diagonal is its permission conjugate, so that's sort of redundant information. And so if you wanted to store this entire matrix, that's 185 gigabytes of RAM, which you understand is nobody has 185 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> even in your wildest dreams. I don't think any computer has enough slots to put in 185 gigabytes of RAM. And so uh, that's still beyond the capability of, I think, I don't know of any computer. I've never heard of any computer having that much RAM. Okay, but the saving grace of this is that the matrices are very sparse. Um, so in your nearest neighbor model, um, the non-zero elements are on the diagonal and six off diagonal. So at most, there are this many non-zero elements in the entire, sorry, typo, matrix of 198 layers. So there are only this many non-zero elements, and that's not bad, it's seven and a half million. That's no big deal. So there's strong motivation to use, you know, sparse matrix methods to solve these equations. Um, and so a lot of the work that Matthew Luisi A. and Klimek did were directly using sparse matrix methods. And the one we're going to be using is the recursive green function algorithm. And this is why at the end of chapter one, we talked about numerically efficient algorithms for getting the... Um, um, current and electron density because when you start looking at numbers like this you quickly realize you know I really don't want to invert this matrix in fact it's impossible to invert this matrix you know, I really only want to calculate exactly what I need and nothing else and so those are the kind of algorithms we'll be looking at and then you know starting in the 1990s um, there was a decade and a half of carbon-based devices in which, you know, first of all, the pi bond model worked really well, where you just put one orbital per atom. And that's really great. So instead of having needing 10 or 20 orbitals per atom like you do for silicon, you only needed one orbital per atom to get a good description of the band structure near, uh, you know, the important energies around the Fermi level. And so, um, you know, for, for during this decade, you know, all the PhD students were able to perform full band, atomistic, self-consistent quantum device simulations using just MATLAB and high-end PCs, and life was good. Unfortunately, the carbon era has kind of come to the end, and you got to do the hard work again. <laughs> so there was a decade, at least a good decade, where students really didn't need to go beyond MATLAB could be lazy with your programming. There weren't that many atoms. You could just handle it, just call the, uh, what do you call it in MATLAB when you want to invert a matrix? Just, um, yeah, right. <laughs> if you wanted the green function, you just call INV. But if you want to go beyond graph, graph, a simple, some simple graphene or carbon nanotube, you quickly, uh, have to do something more smartly. Okay, so, right, instead of these blocks of like a thousand by a thousand for a nanowire for a carbon nanotube, you had something like 13 by 13. And that was, that's what Cairo was doing. So he had, he, he was there in the good times. <laughs> Dealing with 13 by 13 blocks. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really all there is to say about um, finite cross-sections. It's really no different than anything we've done before. You just got bigger block matrices. And you just have to order, order all your atoms in a way that they go, you know, that they come up, all the indices for the first layer come first, and the second layer, third layer, etc. So it's just, you got to set up your Hamiltonian smartly so it looks like this layered uh, tridiagonal block Hamiltonian. Okay, infinite cross-sections. 
And what do you do about infinite cross-sections? Well, this goes back to the stuff we did in 208, in which you handle infinite cross-sections. And, and this is sort of, um, you know, like now we're dealing with 2D. I mean, we used, so we were dealing with, you know, back before the carbon nanotube era, with 3D, you'd go looking at, say, vertical transport, and you'd, you'd assume you're dealing with an infinite cross-section of X and Y, and you'd calculate the transport in the Z direction. And that's what we were doing with the NEMO 3D program, looking at transport through the three five-layered structures. And now in, say, the 2D era, you're looking at transport. You could go be looking you know, down through the layers, in which case it's no different from what we did before with the three fives. Or you can be looking at transport like in an FET along a layer in which you only have one. You assume the width is infinite, like in a transistor. For the most, most people assume the width is infinite because that's actually easier than dealing with a finite width because the width is actually rather wide especially if you're doing something fully atomistically. And so the question is, how do you handle that? Infinite cross-sections. And so the way you handle it is sort of similar to the way we handled, you know, infinite. In 208, we did infinite in like all three dimensions. And we handled that by um, transforming our basis from the localized orbital basis to this block sum basis and going into something that was a function of the orbitals on the repeat unit and k as a function of k. So we introduced k to handle your finite cross-section. And then um, when we do transport, we're going to have to finally integrate over that k. But instead of doing um, what we did in 208, so in 208, this uh, position, you know, this was a three-dimensional vector it ran over all the unit cells in your crystal, right? This is the way we created our block sums in 208. Now in 212, to handle this, we introduce what's called a planar orbital basis. So planar orbital basis, which means that you only um, do this block sum, say this is your structure, and that these planes are actually infinite in X and Y. Each one of these planes is infinite in, in X and Y. Um, and so you're going to go into the block sum basis in KX and KY, but you'll treat it in the localized orbital basis along your propagation direction. And so if you look at, you know, this is what we wrote before. This is what your Hamiltonian is now going to be a function of K. So all these, mat all these block matrices now become functions of K, Kx, but this K is only Kx and Ky. Right. This K is only a two-dimensional K. We're doing transport along Z. This is just Kx and Ky. And so for numerically, when you're doing this, you have to create a numerical grid for Kx and Ky. You choose a kx, ky, and you create your Hamiltonian matrix elements just like what we did in 208. So before in, two, in 208, R ran over all three dimensions. Now, again, I was thinking of the like three fives of silicon and the 100 direction, where each layer consists of two atomic layers, one layer of anion and another layer of cation. So this is a repeat unit. And they come in layer, alternating anion and cation. The repeat unit is an anion cation layer. When we do this sum, we're just R is now a two-dimensional vector in the xy plane. Okay, so basically this is like you know, your discrete Fourier transform, but only in x and y. And L is the layer index for z. L is your layer, your layer number. So Z is still treated in uh, your, lo just your localized orbitals, and K only represents, uh, by doing this, we just you know, bring the whole 
XY cross section down to a single unit cell in the XY plane, so the two atoms. And so now each, if we think of, um, you know, just an ideal crystal like this, and think of silicon or gallium arsenide, each one of these blocks, instead of being, you know, if this were a nanowire, the block size would be whatever this is. The block is now your repeat union, which is just your two atoms and the number of orbitals on those atoms. So instead of going from this massive thing for the infinite cross section, we're back down to our unit cell. Let's say sp3s star um, five orbitals per atom. So my block size would be 10 by 10, right? My block size for each layer would only be 10 by 10, but it's a function of k. But you're only taking one plane. I mean, that's one plane. So, yeah. I mean, that's what determines your block size. So, like the block size of this D. This is my block. When I talk about this block, mate, each one of these is a block, right? So this block size is now, say for silicon or gallium arsenide, sp3 that would just be a 10 by 10 matrix for each to represent each layer the couplings would be 10 by 10 also so now instead of this massive thousand by a thousand that i needed for a nanowire for the infinite cross section i'm back to something reasonable 10 by 10 but i got to do this i got to integrate over k now so i got to do it a lot more times but that's generally an advantage because, again, you know, inversion is an n-cubed process. So inverting a big matrix is much worse than inverting a small matrix many times, right? Because one scales linearly, the other goes as n-cubed. So it's, it's actually much easier to do infinite cross-section than to do finite cross-section. Um, and so the example of um, you really need to visualize where the atoms are to do this. So this is what we're dealing with in um, silicon or gallium arsenide. So if I'm on the anion, you know, I'm I treat I I'm treating each like each each plane in K space with this planar orbital basis, but I have to explicitly look at the matrix elements from one plane to the next plane of atoms. And so the anion couples to the cation. My two cations are here at 1, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1, 1, A over 4. Um, and so I have to understand this to take these matrix elements just like what we did in um, you know 208 uh, so now yeah that's it that's, right I need anion cation here it is anion to cation anion to cation so I'm summing over I mean as usual one of these sums would just cancel off the one over n just like what we did in 208 the other one just is the sum over nearest neighbors and you know I, I, if I'm just looking to, I'm always just calculating going, if I think of Z in the vertical direction, going from the anion to the layer above it. And that will be, t and the other T going below it is going to be that T dagger, is that right? Well, for the example, let's just look at going from A to the next one. So these, these would be the two nearest neighbors in the layer above it. And I would go ahead and I'd calculate that the two nearest neighbors here, I equals one to two, your phase factor, and this would just be your, you know, the, the actual matrix elements, like what we derived from 208. Um, and here's actually, I guess, some actual example matrix elements going between, say, an S orbital on the anion to an S orbital on the cation, or S anion to a PX orbital on the cation in, in the layer above it. And so you get these K dependent matrix elements, and that's why uh, 
That's why these T's are now K dependent. In the nearest neighbor model, the D's are not going to be function of, of K, only the T's. Um, so this is sort of looking from a side view. This is looking straight down. Um, if I'm projecting straight down from the z-axis, this is where these two cations are with respect to the anion. And when I go to the cation plane, this is where the two anions are with respect to the cation. So you get this different phase going from anion to cation plane. And so you, have, so you carefully, you go into a quiet corner and you carefully work this out and construct your um, Hamiltonian matrix elements. But again, you know, these, it's going to be a periodic structure unless you start dealing with heterostructures. Once you figure out how to go from, you know, through these two layers that are, form your repeat unit, then it just gets repeated. And the only thing that's changing when you do device modeling is that you have some varying potential, which is just varying the um, diagonal element of your D blocks. Right? Once you have some potential, like in a PN junction, for example, that's just changing the um, on-site uh, diagonal energy of your diagonal blocks. So we, you know, I worked through some examples of this um, to show what these matrix elements look like in this planar orbital basis, and they're all going to be functions of kx and ky. Um, but you know, once you go through this and work it out then everything goes through as before. It's just that now everything is a function of both energy and K. And this is the same form of the transmission coefficient we had from before. It's just now to get the current, if you look down here, you've got to not only integrate over energy, which is we did before, but now sum over K, and you'll turn that sum over K in, into an integral over K in the usual way. And your Fermi factors are only functions of energy, so they don't, nothing changes there. It's just your transmission coefficient is now k-dependent. All the form of the equations we worked out before are exactly the same. It's just now everything is a function of k because you're solving for a Hamiltonian that's a function of k. Right? So for each k, you construct your Hamiltonian and you solve for your surface green function, you solve for your gamma, your sigma, uh, your G11, your spectral function A11, all that stuff, gamma11. They're all going to be functions of K, and then you need to integrate over K. You get the final observable of the current here, or the electron density here. But the form, all the form of the equations that we worked out in chapter one, the form, the uh, iterative algorithms for the surface green function, um, both in um, the, iterative, the iterative algorithms and the mode space algorithm work exactly the same. I mean, just in the mode space algorithm, those matrices that go into that generalized eigenvalue equations are now functions of the transverse K. But that propaga the propagation factor is in the Z direction. So for each transverse K, well, all the transverse k's decouple because each transverse k is, you know, one transverse k never talks to any other transverse k. The, those, uh, the transverse k is what you call a conserved quantity, right? If you're in a transverse k, you never leave that transverse k. They're all like independent channels. They don't talk to each other, assuming coherent transport, which is what everything we've done until I say otherwise, okay, <laughs> everything we're talking about is for coherent transport. And But nevertheless, even, you know, this equation is still true even for coherent transport. It's just a lot harder to calculate this thing. <laughs> G, G sub n and G sub p. These equations are completely general. This not. For coherent transport, you got to do something different for calculating the current. This is actually completely general. This equation right here, this is valid for either coherent or incoherent transport. Uh, wait a minute. 
I got to think about that for a second. Okay, sorry, my bad. For coherent transport, something changes. You actually need a G sub n in here somewhere. It's a very similar form, but you, you really do need to get this G sub n. So everything, the current gets a little tricky. These expressions for the electron and hole density are completely general. But the important point at this point is that everything goes through as before. All our algorithms look the same. It's just now you have to, the transverse K is an input. So for each transverse K, you just have to numerically do it and integrate over, sum up all your, all your things at the end to get your observable of dense electron density or uh, current. And in terms of the negative equations and algorithms, it looks exactly the same. And this is why from the beginning I started writing out you know, everything in terms of these indices, because this is the way they're going to come out when, you, when they become matrices. All right, your density of states. So before it was just like, you know, the spectral function divided by like 2 pi a. Well, now it's your spectral function. You take the trace, because this is a matrix, right? So you take the trace, you'd integrate over k, and then it's the same as before. You still have your 1 over 2 pi a to relate the spectral function to the density of states. And your electron density, again, this is for coherent transport. Everything looks like what we did before. Your left injected spectral function, your right injected spectral function. And they're all functions of k, so now you just have this extra integral. So 1 over LD sum k is just like an integral over k, right? Integral, in this case, for 2 dk would be d squared k over 4 pi squared. And finally, so this is, if you're using a full band model, you sort of just have to do everything numerically. It's a bit painful. Now, it can be rather painful, but you just have to do anything, everything numerically. Um, but if you're using like, you know, a um, an effective mass model, then a lot of times you'll see these integrals over the transverse k done uh, analytically, and so you see expressions like um, like down here often, or some factor out front like this. So this is for. Um, uh, let's see which one which example is this so for d equals one what's d equals one i see so in this case this would be like a um an fet where you only have you know one transverse k right you're in this planar channel and you only have k y corresponding to the infinite width of your fet right and so you would have you would have to do this sum to get your current, and so you convert that into an integral um, in the usual way. And the thing is, your transmission is. I don't, let's see, what did I do this? Your transmission is only a function of sort of its energy in the z direction. It doesn't depend on, how do I say this? Um, so the energy in the z direction is like your, um, you know, your velocity in the z direction. So if you have a lot of, you know, extra velocity in x and y, it's not affecting on, say, whether you're going to make it over the barrier in Z, if you think of, you know, like a classical, whether you're going to get over the barrier only depends on how much kinetic energy you have in the Z direction, right? So the transmission is only a function of Z. Um, and so you can do these integrals over KY analytically. You assume your parabolic dispersion, right? You convert your integral over KY into an integral over EY. You assume a parabolic dispersion, and you get something like this. And so in 2D, you go through the same thing, convert your sum over a two-dimensional k into an integral, two-dimensional integral over k, um, do the integral over the angle analytically, convert the energy 
and you just end up pulling out your 2D density of states out front. And if you recognize this, this is your 1D density of states, right? And so the expression, the analytical expression for the current in, um, for the one, if you just have, like for your FET, where you just have KY, becomes this. Um, so T is only a function of you know, E sub Z, and your Fermi factors are a function of the total E, EZ plus EY, right? And so you've got this integral of your Fermi factors, and that just becomes these F, you know, script F to the minus one half, which, I don't know, maybe, you know, you need a, a some, you can't do that analytically. But this is, you can just call, this is a, the standard form for your, you know, Fermi-Dirac integral of order negative one half. And so this is what, the expression becomes that you'll see, you know, in for people who use uh, a simple, uh, say, discretized effective mass model to do an FET. This is the expression you'll see for the current, where you've integrated over uh, the transverse K analytically. All right, so if you see something like this, you know this is where it came from. Um, and I guess for, for 2D, where you're going down through a two-dimensional cross-section, like vertical transport, then um, well, the only thing you pulled out, your, two, your effective mass, your 2D effective mass, you can do this analytically. This just gives you this log function, which, you know, if you look in the literature for any amount of time, you'll quickly run across expressions like this for the current, where this is just coming about by the integral of your these Fermi-Dirac factors over the transverse K or energy and you get this log function. Um, and you can go through the same thing for the electron density for your FET or for um, vertical transport in the um, uh, down through the vertical di uh, direction. So these are, you know, if you're just using a simple band model, you, right, in, a par, in, a, in parabolic dispersion, your, your, your dispersion is separable, right? E is just h bar squared over 2m times kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared. So you can, it's easy to separate out what you call ez, ex, ey in terms of the k's. And you can do all this analytically. And so these are type of expressions you'll see that come from integrating out the K analytically. But if you're using a full band model, you cannot do this. There's homework. It's been, uh, homework two is up there on iLearn. It's just doing the rest of the problems in chapter one, a simple RTD model, and then just something after that, just proving that I think that eigenfunction expansion for you to be, um, Retarded green function does indeed satisfy the equation of motion. Um, we'll have a discussion section on Friday. Let's because we have Jing Shi has our DOE uh, the DOE uh, meeting every Friday at, from like you know eleven thirty to uh, one. It, if no one has an objection, can we move back our discussion section? to um, say 110, is that good? It can be any time, yeah, 110 is works for me. 110, 110, Friday, okay. <laughs> I'll put it on, on the, I'll put an announcement up too. Okay, 110 Friday, we'll meet to discuss the homework. Hopefully, yeah, we'll discuss it. Take a look at it, we'll discuss it go from there. All right. So I guess that brings us up to chapter. Oh, now we finally get to the good stuff. This is the fun stuff, the recursive green part. That's what we'll start doing next. Next Monday. That's when things really get fun.